We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me today is not only my sister, Madison, but a very special guest, Lisa Perrin. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Lisa is an award-winning illustrator, hand-lettering artist, designer, author, and educator. She is a professor in the illustration department at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and her work has been recognized by the Society of Illustrators, American Illustration, 3x3 Magazine, and Print Magazine. Her work explores the old world in a new way, combining humor with darkness and beauty with strangeness, and can often be found obsessively making art in the company of her beloved rabbit, Blanche right. Tubun. Thank you. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> That's a really great Thank name. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I see her as sort of this faded southern belle who sort of... Pastor, Pro- thank you. I see the reactions. Yeah, that's that seems right for her. Right. Yes. Today, Lisa is joining us to discuss her new book, The League of Lady Poisoners. Organized into six thematic chapters based on the women's motives, The League of Lady Poisoners is a sumptuously illustrated feast for the senses and a delectable treat for true crime fans and feminist history buffs. Welcome again to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. So as we sort of gushed at the very beginning before we started the proper the proper recording, we were just gushing about how visually stunning the book is. Mm-hmm. I shared that when I got an advanced copy, I opened the box and like physically gasped. <laughs> and I did it in front of my family. So I have two little girls and my husband, nine and 15 respectively is mm-hmm. their ages. And I like pulled it out and I'm like gasping and they're looking at me. Like, what's going on? And I was like, oh my God, you don't understand. It's like raised. And there's like the shields looking green and the texture and the gold. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is like such a beautiful book. And as soon as my husband read the title, he was like, should I be concerned? (laughs) Yes. No. No. Yes. No. It's fine. I was like, maybe. I don't know. Choose your own adventure, I guess. I mean, it's even, it like, it's the quintessential poison color it had we did mm-hmm. a lot of tests with different green like we had to find the green I was very I adamant bet. I was like I need it shiny I wanted to attract all my happy little magpies <laughs> like <laughs> yes exactly so thank you I love hearing that yeah I will kick off the interview as I gushed profusely I was blown away not only did you write this book but you illustrated it what got you into illustration, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, well, that, thank you for asking. I will say I'm sort of probably the reverse of most book creators that you might have on your podcast because I am mm-hmm. primarily an illustrator and I'm sort of new to authorship and the writing of the book. I've always wanted to be an illustrator. I loved picture books growing up. I've always loved drawings and art. And I love how words w- look with pictures. I just love the Mm -hmm. storytelling and the narrative component. And I I love that illustrations can do that so effortlessly. Even if there wasn't text, if you look at a a wonderfully crafted image, it still communicates so much. And that's Mm -hmm. what makes them so accessible to even people maybe who are children or people who speak other languages, like a picture can communicate so much. So that's definitely a big part of my trajectory. I've been a freelance illustrator for many years. I mostly do book covers for other people's books. So when the time came to do the cover for my book, I was like, I do have to go hard. Yes, I I feel a personal responsibility because after doing them for everybody else, everyone's like, what is your cover going to look like? And I was like, ah, it's not going to be Don't ask, please. I got to make it good. So yeah, and now I'm very fortunate to be a professor of illustration and I get to work with very talented students at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art. And I I feel very fortunate that I get to be a working, practicing illustrator, making art that goes into the world. And I get to share that with students. That's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In researching more about your style of work, 
you mentioned kind of having a passion for beautiful whim- whimsical designs with like a hint of the macabre and some like humorous undertones. Do you have like any particular Easter eggs that you kind of like to incorporate in your designs? Or did you have any sort of kind of ongoing hidden theme, even in your book? Mm, Visually. Yeah, I think there's a couple of little things. So there's sort of a few different categories of illustration with that within the book. Mm -hmm. There's the sort of full page portrait illustrations that have, Mm -hmm. they're all sort of the similar composition or format where I have a hand lettered, the name of the the woman accused or convicted (laughs) poisoner, alleged or not. (laughs) legalese that her name the sort of central portrait and then the sort of frame around it that communicates something about her story and on the bottom there was a summary so those are all sort of connected by composition but all of the colors are different I didn't pick a singular color palette for the book for those but for the smaller illustrations which are called spot illustrations those were all unified by the palette which was black, white, and green. And again, this yeah. I chose green very intentionally thinking of shield screen and the sort mm-hmm. of arsenical pigments yeah. and the wallpapers and in the clothing of the Victorian era that mm-hmm. both come up within the book and are just something I'm personally really fascinated by. So mm-hmm. I, 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 I knew gr- green was going to be the sort of secret throughout the book, was kind of hiding green throughout. And you'll see the, the end papers are bright green and there's the yes. bright green metallic edges on the the pages yes I was I even I had to do end paper I've never gotten to do end papers and I was that was something I always wanted to do so oh, that's amazing thank they're you. awesome thank you and mm-hmm. I, much to the credit of the designer I was working with at the publishing house like they really listened to me when I was like I <laughs> I hear you on the cover but here's what I want to do and I and they were like okay <laughs> We can do that. I knew I wanted it to look kind of like a classic Victorian book. So I did lots of research Mm -hmm. looking at how books from that era looked and how they were often cloth bound and had these sort of embossed Mm -hmm. or debossed metallic gold, often just one or two colors. And I said, Mm -hmm. that's what I want to do if if they'll let me. And they were wonderful about really like helping me achieve the very specific vision that I had, which was really opulent. I wanted to make Mm -hmm. a book that people would gasp when they when they saw it because I I wanted to make the book that like 13 year old Lisa would have seen in a store and lost her mind. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. That was the goal. <laughs> you accomplished it beautifully. I think you achieved it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you don't mind me asking, what inspired you to write your book? Yes. I think that's everyone's first question is, you seem like a nice lady. Why did you write a book about poison <laughs> and murder? The nicest lady. I know. And murder. that's so completely I don't know why true. That's... All of the like, sweetest kindest loveliest people I know like secretly or not so secretly have a penchant for true crime and murder stories I think there's a connection there that's worth exploring mm-hmm. psychologically maybe another time <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably yeah probably. <laughs> but uh yeah I think so I'm also a true crime fan I listen to a number of true crime mm-hmm. podcasts and watch episodes of Dateline just when I'm doing other stuff around the house and I think it was always yeah. there but I had never done a project that was true crime specifically inspired. I know that uh, when the pandemic hit, I fi- and I was in quarantine like everyone else, I finally had a lot of downtime mm-hmm. to do a personal project. I'd been teaching senior thesis that year for my students, and it was so exciting seeing them pick these really big, you know, dream passion projects and really like giving it their all. And I was like, I want to do another thesis, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I finally, it was that rare moment where I had the time and I had the motivation, mm-hmm. which those two things never line up. Usually you have the idea, but yeah. no time or the, the time and no idea. Yeah. And actually my best friend yeah. who I had met when I was in graduate school sent me an article because she knows me very well and that I've always kind of loved creepy stuff, but very like historical stuff and artistic stuff. She found this article on Julia Tofana, who is a 17th mm-hmm. century professional poisoner. And the headline is something spectacular, which just like woman confesses to killing 600 men with her special brand of poison. And she was like, mm-hmm. she just wrote, you should do yeah. something with this. And she sent it to me years <laughs> ago and I put it away. I saved it. I buried it in a folder that said, when you have time someday. And I went yep. back to it and I said, mm-hmm. this is so interesting. Specifically, it has the true crime angle. It has the women's history angle, which is something else I'm really interested mm-hmm. in. And I mm-hmm. don't know if I have seen a book that talks just about women and poison. I've certainly seen women and murder and women mm-hmm. and criminals. And 
but I don't yep. know if I had seen specifically that. And I just, I didn't know it was a book yet. I, I For me, it was an art project, which is how it started. I read about her and then I drew a portrait. And I was really frustrated to find that there was no existing portrait of Julia Tofana. And the only ones they put yep. in all these articles are always mm -hmm. these paintings of women dressed like they're in ancient Rome. And I was so yep. troubled by this because I was like, that's not, yep. that's not even vaguely historically accurate because I love fashion history. Yeah. Too. I was like, she would not, that's not what she would have been wearing. That's yeah. not her hair. And I was like, oh, I'm going to fix it. Yep. I'm going to look up what a woman, and again, there's no existing portrait. So I had to take some creative liberties, but I tried to research what a woman in that part of the world at that time, at a successful businesswoman might have worn. So it was a fun mm -hmm. visual research project for me. And then when I was done, I thought, this is interesting. I wonder if there are more stories like hers. You know, she is an anomaly. And once I had a few of these illustrations, I remember realizing oh, I have a book pitch. <laughs> Who do I tell? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's sort of a rambly answer, but that's kind of how it got it got started. Nice. What's your connection to the Criminalia podcast? Oh, aspirational? Like I it's not that I I didn't <laughs> I didn't know them personally before writing this book. I actually while well, I had been researching, had come across a number of their episodes because their whole first season was dedicated to women poisoners. The specific exact thing I was looking for. And mm -hmm. I ended up just finding they had also done a lot of wonderful research and I found that they had a very similar tone and feeling to me in the way that they were sort of approaching this. I was not just going for quick, scandalous blurbs. I wanted more richer context and information and mm -hmm. even a little compassion and empathy, which I found that they mm -hmm. also shared. So definitely cut from a similar cloth there. So when the editor for the book asked me, do I know who should write the foreword? I was like, well, I don't know them, but I think they get it. And if they'd be open to it, I think that like, I would just love to see what they would have to say. And I, I love their forward. I think that it's, it's such a nice introduction to the book. So that was kind of how I got it. So it was, again, it was just because I was a fan and they were gracious mm -hmm. enough to be open to, to doing that for me. So I'm, I'm just thrilled that they were willing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really cool connection. Yeah. And I, I think that also kind of speaks to this realm of, of, the kind of female true crime community and how, you know, we are open to continually spreading these messages of like, it's not just murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's so much more to these poisoning stories than meets the Absolutely. eye. And uh, so much of it's lost based in, you know, shock and yeah. awe or from a more masculine uh, lens of like, look at this pretty lady who murdered all the time. Yes, femme fatale. Or like, yeah. Yes. Right. Or, or the old yeah. hag who actually wasn't an old tropes. hag. And yeah, all these different kind of things and having all these, all these women now, like what we found in like even the independent podcast community, everyone's just so kind and open and willing to share. There's really not a door that's ever really closed. And I really think that's so cool. Not a lot of gatekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. It really the true isn't. crime community, I think, is ironically like the most caring, the most warm, the most <laughs> compassionate. They're the people who are the least likely to, right. actually, you know, it's that ironic thing where you're drawn to these things that are kind of mm -hmm. the, the opposite of you. Like everyone yep. I've met through this work and this research has just been so lovely and friendly and kind. And I, I feel really grateful for the people I'm starting to meet through this community. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. How did you narrow down which women you wanted to cover in your book? That was so hard. There were so many. <laughs> I actually, I've just started putting together like a little presentation because I'm going to be doing a couple of little local book talks. And I had to look back at some of my original yeah. documents and I found like the Excel sheet, the very first Excel sheet every time. <laughs> you should oh, see hers. Oh, I should. I would love She's to see yours. She's got years. Um, yeah. Years mine's, mine's, topics. Yeah, mine's crazy. <laughs> but I love that. Like yeah. that's, I bet it's like such a glimpse inside your brain. <laughs> And like what you're thinking about at any yeah. given moment. Yep. And I, yeah, I had done the same thing where I was like, any time, I just started Googling, you know, wild, reckless Googling. Mm -hmm. At first, I wasn't narrowing it down. I was just trying to come up with as many names as I could. People who identified as women, people who were e connected to poisoning crimes, either they accused of it or convicted of it mm -hmm. or, you know, rumored to have done. And I just had the categories of like their name, what country they were from. Mm-hmm. And then 
a brief synopsis, like a one sentence sort of summary of what they were, what the story is about. And then later kind of adding these categories. Once I realized how I wanted to arrange the book, it was theme or like, is there, is there an overarching mm -hmm. theme? So often there's not, or there's multiple themes. So it, yeah. that was challenging, but I had almost a hundred, maybe I think I had over a hundred names on that list. Wow. And there's only that about does, 25 that's surprising, actually. Yeah. that made it into the book. Yeah. So I really had, it was so hard. I was like, but this one did this crazy thing. And oh, but there's not, <laughs> you know, you can't, I, I use the uh, illusion in the introduction. There wasn't enough room at the Poisoner's Banquet to see yes. everybody. <laughs> yes. And it was already a 200 yes. page book with only 25. So, but I mean, if, if the editor had allowed it, I would have done this for more years. It would have been a tome. It was so interesting. And I learned mm -hmm. so much. In the end, I had to narrow out sort of who could I find the most information about? Unfortunately, it was a big driver. Like there mm -hmm. were some that I was so devoted to and I hunted and I hunted and I just could not get a, any credible source about sure. them. And mm -hmm. when I, and then I would just have to remove them just because I, I wasn't sure or I just didn't have enough. Yeah. And then there were others where I was like, they just don't fit one of the categories or themes. Yeah, that came up a few times mm -hmm. too. Or there's a few I kind of squished where I'm like, that one's a little bit of a tenuous. But <laughs> hopefully, my reader will will give me some grace that it's close enough. But mm -hmm. yeah, they, and then yeah, people who really exemplified those themes. I will say that, and I, I do mention this in the introduction as well. Unfortunately, the ones that there is the most information about are often the people who had the most advantage or privilege. And that's who gets covered by the media. Mm -hmm. Like the, the people who had books written about them and newspaper articles yep. were often white, affluent women. Yep. And it didn't necessarily reflect who the average poisoner really was, which was often people from mm -hmm. a more impoverished community or background. But the, mm -hmm. the newspapers just didn't care the same way. So right. I just, unfortunately, it looks like it's a little skewed that it looks like this is who the average poisoner was, but that doesn't really communicate it. That's just who is important enough, I air quotes on that, to yeah. be chronicled. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I ran into all of those kind of issues, which I'm not a historian, so this was all very new. Again, I'm but a humble picture maker, so this was all <laughs> really new to me. Yeah, I feel like, you know, Lindsay often kind of run, runs into that too. When, when we're researching something, we'll have this incredible topic, but just because of who they were or where they were in the world, it oh, yeah. kind of falls to mm -hmm. time. You know, it, it's just one of those things where it was too much of word of mouth and not enough on paper, either because of who they were or how much money they had, that kind of thing. Like, do they really want people to know? Yeah that these poisonings were yeah. going on. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there are so many more that we will never know about. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Because they were right. either they never caught or never covered or never exposed. I yeah. think I, our numbers on this are probably not very accurate. Just yeah. Yeah. There's a number of factors why we just probably wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Lindsay and I did really like was kind of the toxic timeline mm -hmm. that you use to kind of set up the book with different... Uh, poisonous plants and animals. And the way you kind of sectioned out the book, what kind of drove you to that decision of, of sectioning out the book and, and kind of weaving the story in that manner? Mm, you mean sort of opening with this sort of like the, my poison primer and then leading through the yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That might be the teacher in me that I was like, well, we can't talk about poison till we define what it is and that. where it comes from. Yeah. I, okay. I just, we have the semester starting next week, actually. We just, I was in meetings all day, sort of training meetings. We were talking about rubrics. They're like, you have to yep. define these terms. And I'm like, that's right. I cannot expect them to, <laughs> you know, make work on this unless I've really clarified exactly what I'm talking about. So I don't know. It made sense to me mm -hmm. to sort of start with, hey, what is this? A little bit, I, I guess I love context. I love backstory. And I, mm -hmm. I felt when we talk about something that has such a long and storied history like poison, I think it's so valuable to come to those stories knowing, oh, the, you know, this has been around since humans have been around. Like we were putting mm -hmm. poison on the tips of arrows in, in antiquity. Yeah. You know, we were using lead in everything. Oh, granted, we didn't always know it was all poison at the time, unfortunately. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. You know, mercury and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the is Pieces of flesh melted off. Yeah. Oh, it's you know? terrible. It really is. But yeah. it's, I think it's important to know that because then it helps you realize, oh, I didn't know that poison was so prevalent in this culture. Like, you think, how are these people getting poisoned? Well, in the Victorian era, it was everywhere. It was in every grocery yeah. store. It was in every druggist shop. And if you don't know that, you know, maybe you see the story a little bit differently. So I thought just painting a little bit more background would be helpful for the reader and and even just explaining where some of these different poisons come from, animal, vegetable, and mineral. Again, mm-hmm. just coming to the stories with more of that information already. And also knowing what some of those symptoms and side effects and results of the poisonings were. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't want people to just read, oh, he was poisoned and kind of not think about it anymore. I wanted them to understand, oh, they used strychnine. Okay, this does that thing that they talked about in the beginning, which is the most yeah. horrible thing I can think of, which is where it causes every muscle in your body to like spasm until your head and only your head and your heels are on the floor and you're just arced in this terrible and you're conscious the whole time. So again, it's it's horrible, but I think it's important to help you understand the stories and feel the important and necessary empathy for the victims to understand sort of what the consequences of using that specific poison was. Yeah. I love in the timeline how you can see when science started to like catch up with poison, like just Mm -hmm. how long it was this thing. Because I think people forget that it wasn't until very recently that they were able to actually test for and confirm certain poisons. And so because... Aside from just smelling yeah, it. Yeah, aside from just being like, oh, it smells like almonds, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. So that, to me, like the marsh tests and all that kind of stuff, like that to me is like really interesting to just see, wow, it really wasn't until fairly recently that anyone was able yeah. to know, oh. 19th century. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. that's, I think people assume that we were able to do it much, much longer prior to that. And it's like, no, no, not really. No. No, forensic toxicology is a relatively new field. Mm -hmm. And that was something I didn't know either. And if anyone's interested in that, I highly recommend some of the books by Deborah Blum. Yes. Because she goes deep into the history of how that happened, especially in the first toxicologist's office in New York City. The Poisoner's Handbook. Yes. I was like, my brain will get there. I love that. (laughs) It is so good. And she gives perfect examples of the different types of poisons and like how they went about doing the tests. I loved reading that book. It was so fascinating. It's such a good read. Agreed. And she's really an authority on all things poison related. It was actually one of her articles, the the myth of the female poisoner that like kind of created my thesis for this whole this whole book. So yeah, I definitely awesome. admire her and her writing a lot. But yeah, I think the scientists end up being the heroes in mm-hmm. the story in a lot of ways. Yep. I think I loved when you brought up James Marsh. I'm like, yeah, I love him. <laughs> I, like, yeah. I love that that stayed with you because I was like, that's such a game changer. Can you imagine yeah. that yep. there was no way to prove that someone had died of arsenic poisoning in a court of law until that point? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really like, and I was even reading some of the different ways that they would test and some of these like they would throw things that they thought had poison on it in the fire and if it smelled like garlic then yeah it was arsenic yeah and unfortunately they yep. might eat make an animal eat the same food and see if how the animal mm-hmm. reacted which is very cruel also mm-hmm. but like that was our best guess that yeah. was you know yeah. yeah and to think that there was just a few scientists realizing we needed a better system to keep people safe and to to really prosecute this crime so i definitely i love when things start to shift Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean people Mm -hmm. stop poisoning yep it means that you know as they started to develop science was always trying to catch up with the poisoners and trying to catch that new thing that they were using Mm -hmm. right actually we recently covered another poisoning case last week where i had no idea that they were using plaster to in sweets to cut the cost of sugar yes to cut the cost of sugar yes oh did you do the bradford's yes we did yes (laughs) sorry i'm a nerd yeah (laughs) yeah kudos to you for knowing that (laughs) it's it's crazy to think of how we didn't label white powders Mm -hmm. oh yeah and how how unregulated that was and how common that was for you to just 
guess what was in the mm-hmm. barrel. They look so similar. And that was okay. And you would have, you would keep arsenic in your kitchen because of the rats. Mm-hmm. It's, it, yep. I think one of the, the saddest stories that I encountered were those, were the accidents. Yes. Or someone just mm-hmm. did, did not know. And it, that happens more than you would hope either. Yep. Like something right. as simple as just like, oh, it looked just like the sugar. It was next to the sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a heartbreaking story. Yeah. And then but the good thing, I hopefully what comes out of some of this is legislation. Yes. Right. Where they started yes. like mm-hmm. there was a no law that said children couldn't buy arsenic until they passed that law. Yes. I mean, you know that right. means children were buying arsenic exactly. or they wouldn't have had to do something about it. Yeah. yeah. What were they doing with it? Mm-hmm. So right. yeah, again, unfortunately, everything's always playing catch up. The yep. science mm-hmm. and the laws, trying to realize, oh yeah. this thing is happening and we need to we need to do something about it yeah it's one of those uh we didn't realize we had to make a law against this until it was until very somebody did it we need a law until against enough this. tragedy happened <laughs> yeah. right yeah right and yeah. then there you go mm-hmm. Man. so what came first the illustrations or the copy or did you do them mm-hmm. in tandem I, I always appreciate that question it's like a chicken or the egg yeah <laughs> and they both happened at different times. I definitely started with the illustrations. It was, for me, this is sort of an art project that got out of control <laughs> and then like it became a book. So I started with illustrations nice. and then when it became a pitch and then became a book deal, I had to pause in the illustrations and sort of focus on the writing. So there was sort of illustration in the beginning, a lot of research, mostly a ton of research and reading and writing in the middle. And then once all of that was submitted, I had to go back and flesh out all of the illustrations so Mm -hmm. which is the part I'm the most comfortable with in a dream world I would have loved to have done the section written the section on that woman and then illustrated her in sort of the same window and kind of the same time Mm -hmm. when I was thinking about it but that's not how the deadlines were working out they needed (laughs) they needed the uh, initial manuscript much sooner than they needed because it has to be proofread and edited so I sort of had to go through Mm -hmm. all of the writing part and then once that was submitted and it was being reviewed that's when I had my window to go back to the the illustrations and really round them out and even then I the plan was 80 illustrations and I think there's close to 100 in the end because I I'm a try hard I went too hard (laughs) (laughs) and also because when I saw the book in the layout there were a few areas where there were like you know just the way text blocks would work out there would be large empty areas and I was like I'm an illustrator this is an illustrator book there can't just be one big yeah big empty pages I know and I was like I gotta go back so like the last few like weeks before it was due I like knocked out like 20 (laughs) more illustrations to just like squeeze in those empty areas because I was like I can't let it go out like that it needs it needs a little bit more flourish you know just to fill the that space but yeah it was definitely I was looking back also just the scheduling of everything where it was like each month I did like month to month week by week what I had to do to get it all done. But I will say while I was researching, I would sketch too. And then I would have those sketches from when I was Mm -hmm. in that moment reading about this particular figure that I could go back to and be like, oh, okay, I have a starting point. Because otherwise it was hard to go back and be like, Mm -hmm. oh, is she? Oh, okay. That makes sense. I mean, it also makes sense too when you added those extra illustrations because it started as, I want want that thesis again. I want that passion again. And you finally had a passion project. So yes, you have deadlines, but at the same time, you're having fun. You're being Mm -hmm. creative with, you're restricting your own creativity with this, you know, like it's your book, it's your baby. You get to do whatever you want. Oh yeah. And this was like the first time, like, cause like I said, I usually do covers Mm -hmm. for other people's work. So it's a, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen who have to approve it. And this time it was just me. Like I just had to make something that pleased me that I liked. So it was so freeing and so exciting in that way. Like I, I drew what I wanted mm-hmm. to draw. And for the most part, no one wanted to know <laughs> uh, on the art side. We did a ton of editing on the writing side, mm-hmm. but on the art, they, they generally were really open to it. So I really got to have a lot of fun. I think you see that most in mm-hmm. the spots. Those like, ended up being some of my favorite mm-hmm. ones, those little ones where like, I think I just drew the rat yeah. poison or yeah. I just drew, you know, like the, yeah. the packaging yeah. for it. And I was like, I think that and it's just called rough on rat. Yeah. And it's just, it's just like a big illustration of like a, a dead rat and I was like I'm gonna draw that no one said I yeah did. I mean so. well and it fits like it I, does I, I mean unless and it, but it mm-hmm. makes sense it's relevant it's not like it was 
particularly like gory looking or anything like that. I I mean, it just kind of flows with Mm -hmm. everything else. So. Yeah, that, that was definitely fun. And it was fun to tell my students, like, well, they're working on their big project. Yeah. <laughs> I'm there, too. I know it's hard. We're mm-hmm. going to get through it. You know, it, it was also, I think there was a nice, like, mm-hmm. solidarity. Like, I know. It's a lot of, I got a lot of homework mm-hmm. tonight, too. I feel you. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. During kind of the course of researching and writing the stories for the different women you covered, did any of them really kind of stick out to you as like a favorite? I, I know Giuliano was who you started with, but was there really kind of one or two women in particular that you just were like, oh, this is such a cool story? There's a few that, that stay with me for different reasons. I think there were a lot that mm-hmm. surprised me that I thought I knew the story and I was actually mm. totally wrong. For example, like Lucretia Borgia, yes. who, and forgive me if I'm butchering her name, who has this reputation as being this femme fatale renaissance poisoner with this ring mm-hmm. full of poison. And there's no mm-hmm. proof of any of that. And that has yep. survived for centuries, yep. this rumor. How many TV shows um, and movies. So and... reading about yeah. her was so interesting. And, you know, even reading that uh, historians are now saying we, we've really overdone it. Maybe the Borgias maybe behaved like most powerful families of their time period. They weren't doing anything exceptional Mm -hmm. or different. So some of those surprises in terms of favorite stories, it's so hard. I think I, again, these are like my 25 favorites. That's how they got here. One of the ones that just jumped into my mind first, so I'll talk about that one, was Sally Bassett, who was the enslaved woman in Bermuda who used poison in sort of an act of defiance against her and her Mm -hmm. grandmothers and slavers. Again, a story I never had heard about, I didn't know anything about, and of all the women in the book, I found myself rooting (laughs) for her the most and sort of empathizing with her story the most. There's a few where you're like, this person is a monster. This person is is committing murder, and and they know what they're doing, and they're Mm -hmm. doing it to cause harm. I think there were a few women in that chapter. There was an escape and defiance chapter. There was also the angel makers Mm -hmm. of Nagirev who also uh, use poison against mm-hmm. abusive husbands. So I think those were good examples of why the context matters yes. so much and why getting a little bit more of the story is really important before you just brand someone as a poisoner or as a murderer. Again, I'm not condoning right. it. Yeah. Right. I'm not condoning <laughs> ever. No crime. <laughs> ever, ever harming, poisoning, murdering anyone. But I am saying it's worth it to get more information yep. about the story before we jump to conclusions. Yep. But they were, they were the few where I was like, because most of these are not good yes. people, where I was like, okay, I, I think their stories are more sympathetic. But then there were some that were just so weird or so funny yeah. that I, to right. me, funny to me, obviously, not to them yeah. in that moment or the people <laughs> that they harmed. But or just so gruesome and shocking. Like I also think of like, and everyone in the money green yep. chapter I thought was just sort of outrageous. One of my favorites that I also didn't know about was Yia Murano from Argentina in the 1970s. Yes. Yeah. Who like they who became like a, a sort of icon in Argentina. <laughs> she was made a number of television yep. appearances after serving her prison time for poisoning three of her friends and they made a musical <laughs> about her. And like I was yep. just I was like you can't make that <laughs> stuff up. That's amazing. <laughs> Like what? So like again, they all they're all special and different, but yeah, they all stay with me in different ways. It's awesome. So you mentioned that you started from this huge list of like a hundred women and you narrowed it down to twenty five. So obviously mm-hmm. you researched some that you had to leave out. Yeah. Is there one story or more than one that you really wanted to include, but you just Again, with the different categories you had, or because there wasn't enough information, there's just no way you could have incorporated them in the, the book. Yeah, there's a few. There's one really famous woman poisoner who I didn't include because she's so similar to another story that I chose to include. Mm-hmm. So her name is Lydia Sherman, and she's like often called the Derby poisoner or the Connecticut Lucretia Borgia. Okay. And she also poisoned her husband and children for these life insurance policies, which was very similar to Marianne Cotton's yes, story that yes. happens in the UK at a very similar time. And I was like, oh, they're both so good. I can't, they're so similar though. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was so torn. But I think, again, I was trying to be more global and I felt I had enough from the United States. So there was like a reason I chose yep. 
Marianne over over Lydia. But again, just like <laughs> this breaks my heart to leave them. They're so interesting too. Right. There was also, and I might uh, forgive me, my memory's not as good now because this was a long time ago. Sure. But there was a woman in Japan. There was a, a geisha who had supposedly poisoned her lover mm-hmm. in this like love triangle or love tryst, and I wanted that so badly. I wanted to draw a geisha mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the beautiful traditional costuming mm-hmm. and makeup with a bottle of poison. And that was one where I could not get enough information. The things I could find were in Japanese mm-hmm. and I could not find a translator or, and there was never enough. It was like the same paragraph everywhere. Sure. That, yeah. Yeah. Was, I even emailed like a woman who like researches like Japanese culture and had like a chapter on her in a book, like, I don't know if she ever saw it, but I was trying, I really wanted that one. I think when I finally made the decision to cut that, because I didn't have anyone else from Japan and a major goal for me for this book was for it to be as global and diverse as it could be, because so many of the stories I kept finding, and it was still true in the end, was mostly Western white women. And I knew that these themes are so global and so universal and poison and access to it is so global and universal. It can't just be in the United States and the UK that this is happening. But it was so much harder to get that information from countries outside of the Western canon. So I just, I, there were a few where I really wanted them. There was another one, an ancient like queen. Gosh, I'd have to go back and look at my, my giant Excel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> From like the first century BC, and sure. I was like, "Can't? There's no way. I just can't." <laughs> yeah. find enough. There's For not sure. enough stones etched. There's no, like to right, to etch out the whole story, <laughs> chisel it into stone. Yep. And, you know, but like I said, there's if this interests anyone, I highly recommend. I include some of the resources in the back of the book that I used, and there's so much more to oh, learn, yeah. and there's so many more stories to be gleaned from all of this. But yeah, I there were definitely a few that got away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For me. So if you could chat and like kind of chat with any of the lady poisoners in the league you've assembled, who would you talk to and what would you serve at the table? Oh, that's the best question. I think anyone's (laughs) asked me about this yet. Well, like if you think about it, you know, like say you were to have tea, what would you serve? First of all, I wouldn't want to meet any of them because they're poisoners and I wouldn't eat anything. (laughs) That's kind of the the joke about the poison. We should banquet. preface yeah. it. They couldn't harm you. <laughs> yeah, they can, they're just sort of there. Like ghosts, like ethereal beings, ghosts. Yes, yeah. yes. If this was a seance. <laughs> <laughs> if this was a seance, who would I summon? A five, a five G connection. You know, really you know, clear. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're at safe distance. Yeah. We can't be harmed by them. Because I was going to say, in real life, I I don't think I want to be on the wrong side of any of these ladies. Exactly. Because they're all known exactly. to commit crimes. And what what would I serve? Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. Who would I want to talk to the most? Kind of going through my Rolodex in my brain. So many that are so interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't. I think the, for some reason the one that jumped into my head, so I'll go with that, is Marie Lafarge, who was the French woman who used rat poison to murder her husband and was sort of the first one to be sentenced because of the results of the the Marsh test. Mm-hmm. Um, and for her, it was such an instance of bad timing for her. Like if she had just acted a little sooner, yeah. she might have gotten away with this crime. <laughs> and I would be like. Were you mad? At James <laughs> like, did you know about him? Like, were, did, how did you feel about like being the first person to kind of have this, ke- like, chemist forensic evidence that like proved that there was arsenic in your mm-hmm. husband's tissues? Whereas women for thousands of years, not just women, poisoners right. for thousands of yeah. years before you the- have done and gotten away with this. She was sort of the and not to say that there weren't people convicted on scientific evidence, but the first who was really this direct toxicological mm-hmm. evidence. Yeah, I'm, I would love to know kind of what was going through through her mind. And so the problem was that like she married this guy and then found out he was a, a liar. He had sort of misrepresented mm-hmm. himself and his wealth and his mm-hmm. status. And, you know, I, I don't think she's a sympathetic figure. I, I don't think <laughs> even <laughs> given that, that right. murder was... Like murder, still murder. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, what made her do that, make that extreme choice? And was it, you know, how did she feel in the end about it? Because it became this huge public trial and everyone knew her name. And Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I'd be so curious. So she's someone I would be curious to talk to at a safe distance where she couldn't get at any, <laughs> any of my food. No possessions or <laughs> no, tampering with No, I don't even want to, not even a handshake. I was yeah. like, thank you. Thank you, no thank you. But yeah, that jumped into my mind. I also thought about Amy Archer Gilligan, who was the one who run, ran the, um, the home for the senior citizens. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that one is just like a what was going on there yeah. like she just developed this sort of business plan that involved people dying and that was yeah. necessary to keep making money mm-hmm. and she just kept doing it and she also really misrepresented herself or maybe she thought she really was this pious biblical devout woman but that's right. how she you know seemed about town and then she committed all of these really cruel grisly murders of these mm-hmm. people who were under her care mm-hmm. yeah so she's just another person where i'm like what's what's in your mind right. how did this yeah. happen how did you turn into this person mm-hmm. yes you couldn't have always been this person like how yeah. when did you first decide you know i'm gonna poison that guy <laughs> yep that's that's what i'm gonna do that's that's the right answer to my problem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then i can do yep. this for a living casually yeah and i'm gonna make this work mm-hmm. and i'm gonna do this for oh as long as i can yep. Yep. yeah and to just keep doing it mm-hmm yeah, so many questions. I don't think I'd get good answers. Probably not. Probably not. So many of them. They'd, probably They'd probably just be like, be well, I thought I'd get away with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gosh, what would I serve them? I, the first thing that came into my mind was just like a green absinthe looking drink just to give them <laughs> sort of a taste of their own medicine. Right. Like, do you trust what I just gave you? Yeah. <laughs> what would I serve? Like, oh, I don't know. Do you trust me, a, a woman holding a cup that looks green? I don't know. It's just like an apple teeny, but they have no idea. Right. They're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> a Midori sour. Right, yeah. It's actually really like cute and sweet and it's, yeah, sugary, and but it looks scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some dry ice in it. Yeah. Yeah, the little smoke coming out, but... Love yeah, it. that's a that's that's a fun question. I'm going to think on that one more, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, that's kind of what yeah. I... My vision for, or my dream for the book, because I love Broadway, I love theater, I love musicals, that's like my other secret Mm -hmm. passion, poison and musicals, I get a very different, but I was like, they find a way, if I could, to connect, they, 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 my dream is that they do find a way, and like, I was like, if this was a play, how would I set the stage, what would the first scene be like, when I was trying to write the introduction, because I had no idea where to start, Mm -hmm. and I was like, if I could, I would like bring them all together, even though they're from all across the globe and all mm-hmm. across time in like this long banquet hall dinner where they all sit down together to eat a meal in the presence of other lady poisoners. Mm-hmm. And how would everyone feel and how would everyone react to each other? Yeah. So that was sort of right. Exactly. Going there and sort of and in my mind, I'm sort of sitting at this table, too. Right. Yeah. Where I'm just like observing. So, yeah, that question definitely aligns with sort of this sort of vision of how I first entered the book mm-hmm. and then they would sing <laughs> there'd be a musical <laughs> number <laughs> about like why they had to do it mm-hmm. and what happened and then you'd sort of you know hear all of the different stories and that's 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 the, the Broadway show <laughs> this is the point where we say trademark trademark it now like in the trademark <laughs> trademark <laughs> trademark trademark poison the musical right <laughs> trademark I'm just picturing trademark. The one number from Chicago, like he had it coming, like in that, yes. that, that style. Well, and I, I was that. thinking of the play Arsenic and Old Lace, like the two oh. sisters. Yes, mm-hmm. I didn't remember till I was working on the Amy Archer Gilligan chapter. I was in that play yeah. in high school. <laughs> I was one of the little old ladies yeah. in, who poisons people. I had totally forgotten that. Until I was reading it, and I was then I read, oh, actually, Amy Archer Gilligan was one of the inspirations for the playwright who wrote mm-hmm. Arsenic and Old Lace, which became, which was a play and then became a film. Yes, yeah, so there is precedent for right. um, <laughs> a poison-based theatrical production. Maybe so. It's not a, it's not out of left field. Totally. Even though it hasn't even officially come out yet, it will as of the time that this recording comes out. But oh, great. do you have any plans to write and illustrate another book? That's that's the question now, isn't it? Yep. Yes. Every, yes. It's going to come out in a, a little less than a month. So I am very excited and trying to just sort of be in the moment and, and bask mm-hmm. in that. But definitely I'm like, what's next? I got to come up with what's next. I loved doing this. Mm-hmm. So my sincere hope is my editor goes, 
all right, <laughs> this Lent okay, we'll let you do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have, a, I have a list, a working list of like ideas mm-hmm. for future books. I de- again, I definitely want it to be richly illustrated. I think that that's like part of the appeal for me. But I'm pretty open-minded, and if you or any of your fans or listeners have ideas or things they want to see mm-hmm. written about in this way, in this sort of style with pictures, like, I would love to know. I, I'm curious how people react to this book, and after it, if there's anything they say, oh, I wish there was blah, blah, now mm-hmm. that I've finished this. So I might crowdsource that answer. <laughs> well, I guess this is kind of the last question, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of closing us out, yeah. Is there anything else that we haven't already kind of asked that you'd love for our listeners to know about your book? That's another thoughtful question. Just that it's coming out on September 19th. (laughs) It'll be available in stores. I'm so excited for it to be in the world. I'd love to see people engage with it. Like if you take a picture, like my dream is like people dress up and then they take pictures with the book and like with like, Oh, that'd be around amazing. Halloween. I don't know. Yeah. And if you do that, please tag me or send it to mm-hmm. me because it would just be the thrill of my life. I would be so delighted. But I'd love to hear what people think about it. I mean, I don't think it's, you know, a sort of safe or easy topic. I think it brings up some really interesting themes mm-hmm. and questions that, you know, we could talk about and debate about. So I just look forward to seeing what it makes people think about and mm-hmm. how they react and how they they respond. And I do hope that the art, because this didn't have to be an illustrated book. So mm-hmm. I, I do hope that the art, I'm curious to see how that helps their experience too, or changes their experience too. Because when I told people I was doing this, I said, oh, I'm illustrating a book. They said, oh, for kids. And I went, no, not for kids. Yeah. <laughs> Very much not for kids. So it's definitely sort of in this weird genre where it's an illustrated book that is not for children, but it is nonfiction it's mm-hmm. but it's not a textbook mm-hmm. so it's sort of in this new sort of middle space where and I'm just curious to see how people feel about that and I believe in my heart I, th- I think I know the answer which is grown-ups like pictures too yep. we, yeah I mean yeah <laughs> I don't know why we stop putting pictures in books when people hit a certain I love age. pictures in books well and I yeah. think there there's something to be said too about our kind of generations I know we're probably you know within the same kind of range of age and how we really loved these books and we we were familiar with books that had this similar styling because I feel like even in like Mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s there was picture books were a huge thing but they they did also have more content like the picture Mm -hmm. books grew with you there was Mm -hmm. very little kind of there wasn't really a point where it it ended it did eventually but like Mm -hmm. I I feel like with this it kind of makes you reminisce about those books that you used to have and the books that you would read with your with your loved ones like your grandparents and your parents of of something that like kind of stuck with you and I think you know aesthetically as well this styling in particular is one that I always kind of gravitate to that you know Mm -hmm. the kind of whimsical cutesy macabre like it's it's yeah. cutesy enough to be yes. non-threatening mm-hmm. but it's yeah it's, I didn't want to go scary but I think that also kind of helps with your point of adding that piece of humanity to it because some of these mm. stories are dark and they are terrible and these women are horrible mm. but when you create these beautiful illustrations of who they like how they might look mm-hmm. like what environment they might be in it adds this piece to it that I think is often lost in a lot of nonfiction. And so I think that's something that a lot of people will gravitate towards. And this is one of those books where it's just nice to kind of reference and go back to, this could be a comfort book. You know, this could be something where they just want to look at the illustrations again. They wanted to be Mm -hmm. reminded of a story. Like the stories aren't too taxing. The Mm -hmm. content isn't too taxing and, it flows really well. So I think it's going to do well. I, I mean, you've got, you've got quite, I, I know our audience will love it. Mm-hmm. And I think the, our community as well, this will probably spread like wildfire. Honestly, I yeah. think, I think as long as you continue to kind of reach out to oh, this, God. this community, yeah. your book will be well loved. Let me just say thank you. <laughs> Everything you said just now was so beautiful and so touching. I, I didn't expect such like a, a heartfelt, like 
when you talked about why illustrations and books mean something to you, that was, that was as for me as an illustrator and mm -hmm. illustration teacher, that was so, that was really beautiful <laughs> and really good, really validating to hear. Yeah. So thank you. I, let me just say for, for sharing that with me, that made me feel great. Yeah, good. I, I, I mean, it, it's honest. Like my, my sister and I, we were raised in the back of a newspaper. Uh, our parents were publishers. They own their own oh news weekly newspapers. So, so books were really oh important gosh. in our life and how mm -hmm. we grew up and Lindsay has like a really beautiful kind of library of books herself mm -hmm. I have a very paltry collection in you know in comparison but I, also I am still... the book hoarder of the two of us yes but There's like that's not two books we don't two bookshelves it. behind me yes yeah but so as you were talking about the the books that stay with with you I was immediately drawn to my collected works of Beatrix Potter book right oh that's that yeah I love Beatrix yeah. Potter and Peter Rabbit talk about something that like stays with you yes from childhood well through your adult right. years those stories those images the world she mm -hmm. created yeah and I I, I yeah. think you you invoke the same feeling oh, you know gosh that is high praise. Thank you. <laughs> when I was reading the book, you tell the story in a way that's almost conversational. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, it's, you read it in a way as if we're having a conversation, but it's a one-sided yeah. conversation, but it's still a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking a lot in that conversation. <laughs> it's fine. I like to listen, even though I talk oh. on a podcast, but I will tell you. So I, I brought it with me on a work trip. <laughs> So I could finish reading the book before I gave it to Madison so she could finish reading it before we talked to you. Mm -hmm. And I showed it to one of my coworkers who is also an illustrator, like a graphic artist. And she like didn't what? want to give it back to me. And I was like, <laughs> well, I have to have it back oh. because I need to read it. <laughs> oh. Then when I was sitting on the plane, like reading it, the woman that was sitting next oh. to me, she was like, what are you reading? Because it looks really cool. Mm -hmm. And I was oh. like, well, I'm going to tell you, but it doesn't come out for a while. But, yeah. you know, just you should check oh. it out if you're really interested. Mm -hmm. And so she, like, wrote it down on her, like, phone. She was like, yeah, I'm going to check it oh. out. And, oh, that's so exciting. and when I was at my local Barnes & Noble the other day, I was talking about it. And they were very excited to get it in. So... Thank you for uh, <laughs> selling it. No problem. Yeah, I got you. That's, I thought you were going to say, I was reading it on the plane and everyone looked at me like, oh my God, I'm scared. I don't want to sit next to this lady. I'm, gonna I'm sure move. some people did, but like, you know. Let me like, hand you your coffee. <laughs> right, I know. I, that's like the joke now. People, whenever they're sitting next to me, they just like take their coffee and like, go away. Like, I, I'm like, I get it. I totally get it. But, you know, you're safe. <laughs> Like I said, I, I make book covers. That's like my primary work that I do as an illustrator. I wanted to make something that people wanted to have on their mm -hmm. shelves. And that like would also become like not just a book, but like a special object in their home. Because I think that our favorite books do become mm -hmm. that. Like I know I have my favorite books. I like face them out on my shelf and I love mm -hmm. the cover. It's something really special to me. So I just wanted it to be a book that, you know, just was part of people's lives and that they wanted mm -hmm. to have out because they liked it and they enjoyed it and it, they liked how it looked and they it makes them feel excited to see like that kind of mm -hmm. colors and mm -hmm. imagery. So I definitely like even just hearing those examples, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yes. I think you accomplished it. I, yeah. I mean, it's definitely, a, and I am one of those types of readers where when I go into a bookstore, I gravitate first towards the covers before mm -hmm. I read, you know, the oh, back. Me too. And it is of definitely course. one of those books where I would stop whatever I'm doing to go pick up that book and look at it. Yes. That was that based was on like the foil alone. And like, yeah. I literally, when I, I keep going back to it, when I took it out of the package <laughs> and I'm like looking at it, I was, I was like, you don't understand this green significant. This green right. is significant. It shields green or yeah. Paris green as it can be known to. If that's an arsenic thing. I love that you knew that. <laughs> Because I, I made it knowing, I was like, my reader is going to yeah. know mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. right? It's probably like, listen to all the podcasts I've mm -hmm. listened to, you know, watched all the books or watched all the YouTube videos and read all the books. And I wanted to honor that, like, my reader might already have a, a little bit of a background in this. And if they, like, know that it's that green, they're going to get even right. more yep. excited. So that's like... It's like a yeah. subtle nod to the people that already kind of know what the topic is without mm -hmm. without even opening yes. the book yep so yeah yeah absolutely 
kudos to you. Hats off to you. (laughs) Thank you. You know, when I did it, I was like, is anyone going to care that I like, does anyone, Mm -hmm. you know, that it, that it has all of these illustrate, like, am I working to like, do I need to be working as hard as I'm working? But I knew that it was what I would love. Like I wanted to make something I wanted. And it's really exciting to hear that other people would, would like and Mm -hmm. want to respond to it too. I would like to thank Lisa for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor talking to you. Mm -hmm. And before we go, can you please tell our listeners where they can find a copy of your book, The League of Lady Poisoners? And let me just say thank you both so much, Madison and Lindsay. This was so much fun. (laughs) Your questions were so thoughtful and your responses were so insightful. (laughs) This was a pleasure for me. You can find The League of Lady Poisoners wherever books are sold. I highly recommend supporting your local independent Mm -hmm. bookstore, but it will be available through places like Amazon and Target as well. And if you want to find me online, I go by my last name online, which is Perrin, P-E-R-R-I-N. So my tag on everything is made by Perrin. And that's how you can find me. But thank you so much. Thank you. For sure. Thank you again so much, Lisa. And on that note, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As Ilda's Crime.